morning, or I suppose afternoon now, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and get started um, with this chat. I just want to welcome you all um, and thank you for coming and joining us to talk a little bit about our life here at Wayne State University School of Medicine. We're really excited to share our experiences with you, not only with the school, but um, just about living in Detroit as well and how we decided where we were going to live and that kind of stuff. So thank you all for joining us today. We have an excellent panel of both M1 and M2 students who want to share their experiences with you. So we're just going to start off with some introductions. Um, each of these panelists is going to go ahead and introduce themselves. And then I'll just invite you all to turn your cameras on, turn your mics on, ask questions. Or if you're uncomfortable with that, uh, feel free to put questions in the chat and we'll try to answer those as well. Um, so we're really here for you guys. We, we want to get to know you. We want to answer your questions. So um, I hope that you guys enjoy this event. Without uh, further ado, we'll go ahead and start some introductions. Catherine, if you uh, want to get, get that started. Hi guys, my name is Catherine. I'm from California. I went to undergrad at Northeastern in Boston. Um, I chose, oh, my major was health science. My, uh, I chose Wayne State because I really like the hands-on experiences they give you early on, especially. Um, where I did my gap years, they said that the Wayne State residents were like always the best trained because they, they got to meet and interact with patients so early on. Like we start our second year, we really start re um, going to the clinics um, to work with patients. And that's one of the reasons why I picked Wayne and um, things I'm involved in. So I am the, I'm on the wilderness medicine um, interest group board. I'm on the world health student organization board and I'm on the Latino medical student association board. Hi guys, I'm Claire. I am an M2. I'm originally from Georgia, but uh, my parents are from Michigan, so we moved after high school. So I went to the University of Michigan for undergrad and majored in neuroscience. So why Wayne State? Um, it was the only one I was accepted to, honestly, but so it kind of chose me. But I'm really happy here. We get a lot of um, diverse patient populations, which I think is really important to experience so early on in your career. Uh, I was also really drawn to the use of cadavers for anatomy lab, which is pretty unique to Wayne. So um, that was exciting and a good experience for first year. Uh, some things I'm involved in at the school is a club called First Aid First. We teach emergency basics and first aid to the community. Um, art and medicine, I like to draw, so we have some club activities where we just get together and uh, do some fun art together and get away from the medical side of things. Hi everyone, my name is Ariel. I'm an M1. I am from Detroit. Uh, I went to undergrad at a small HBCU in Mississippi called Alcorn State University, and I was a biology pre-med major. Why Wayne State? Well, um, I was born and raised in Detroit, so I really wanted to come back home and uh, pretty much work for the city who like gave me so much. And I just really like all the research opportunities and Wayne State's network is just so far reaching. So I just really wanted to be a part of that. And some things I'm involved with here at Wayne, I am the first year representative for the Black Medical Association. Um, I'm in the neurosurgery interest group and I'm a student ambassador and also I work for Gigi's Playhouse, which is like tutoring for children with Down syndrome. Hey guys, I'm Brennan. Um, I'm from Southeast Michigan. Uh, for undergrad, I went to U of M in Ann Arbor. I majored in uh, biopsychology, cognition, neuroscience. It's just a glorified psych major, to be honest. It just has a lot of names in it. Um, I chose Wayne State. Uh, for a couple of reasons. One is the, you get like a lot of clinical skills practice very early on, which I think is gonna be very helpful helpful for rotation starting third year. Um, there's a ton of clinical opportunities as well for your first two years. And um, I wanted to be in Detroit, like downtown to interact with the patients in my years of rotations, because I think I'll be learning a lot that way compared to other medical schools that aren't in like a city. And then things I'm involved in, I'm a coordinator for the LGBT people in medicine coordinate at the Children's Center, which is a, a um, center in, in downtown Detroit where we work with kids to give them like enriching opportunities. And then I'm also involved in research as well. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Mark. I'm from uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan, but I went to undergrad at Xavier University in Cincinnati. Um, and so I, uh, I was a biology major. Um, I chose Wayne State because I wanted to come back to Michigan. Um, 
So I always like, that was my goal. And so looking at all the Michigan med schools, I felt Wayne State did a great job presenting opportunities for both clinical experience while also like being able to like serve a community. Um, and so, and uh, as Catherine said, like I knew doctors that went to Wayne State or knew about Wayne State because a lot of doctors around the country and they all talked about how great the residents were and great like the people from Wayne State were trained. So that was a big draw for me. Um, things I'm involved with at Wayne State, uh, I do research on smoking our uh, smoking cessation study. Um, I was involved with ARI, which is like, it works with like special needs kids and reaches out to them in the community and kind of bridges the gap between like healthcare and like special needs families where there's a lot of intimidation or fear of healthcare in that group. And then um, I also worked at the hyperlipidemia clinic at the Children's Hospital, but we haven't been able to be in there because of COVID. All right, everybody, at this time, uh, feel free if you want to ask a question, you can turn on your microphone or turn on your video and ask us, or you can uh, put it in the chat if you guys have any questions. Um, I, I don't see any questions in the chat yet, but I'll give you guys a minute to go ahead and ask those questions. Otherwise, I'll go ahead and pull some of the ones you guys submitted um, in advance. I, I, I was wondering, it seems that um, everyone, all these med students are very much involved. So I was just wondering what a day looks like and how it can be so balanced that you can get so involved in just the community engagement. And as well, this is the first time I'm hearing, um, meeting some students that got to do research as well. So, I mean, I can speak on the research aspect. Um, I'd say like the first few months of med school, at least me personally, I focused solely on class for the most part, just to get used to the increased workload. And then you kind of add stuff in as you realize what you can do. But like the research, it really depends on what you do in research. Like me personally today, I woke up at 2.30 in the morning to go into the lab until 6 a.m. I would not recommend it. It sucks, but you kind of just get your schedule together and find what fits into where you have free time and it kind of just works like that. So yeah, I went till 6 a.m. I came back and slept for four hours and then started working on stuff for, for the, the day, like class and that stuff. And the fact that um, lectures are online even before COVID, um, most people watch lectures online. So it's very flexible in that aspect. Um, every once in a while, depending on the week, you'd have a required event where you have to meet in small groups um, or do your anatomy or things like that. But for the most part, you can kind of build your schedule around that and then decide how involved you wanna be with other things. Thank you. So, I mean, I see a question in the chat here. How safe is it to live in downtown Detroit? Um, and how is living on campus like finding your own place around the area? So, I mean, downtown Midtown, I mean, me personally, I feel completely safe. I never feel like I'm in a dangerous place. I'm, I'm, in, I'm living in Midtown. Um, generally, I think it's pretty easy to find a place. Like they're, they're like the big apartment complexes that usually have wait lists. So you can put yourself on wait lists like that, but there are, there are a decent amount of places you can find to live in Midtown or downtown. It is more expensive probably compared if you were to um, come from like Oral Oak or Ferndale though. Yeah, and um, just to add on to that, a lot of people in the Facebook group will, if they're moving out of their apartment, they'll like, the, so that's how I got my apartment. I live in a studio and like not a big building. And one of the M3s from last year, so M4 now, um, gave me her apartment because she's moving out. Um, so it's it's really easy to find a place. You can ask them about it if they felt safe and whatnot. Because I mean, I was I hadn't even seen this place before I moved in. I came here from Boston without even seeing it first. So um, it's definitely doable. That kind of stuff. Yeah. Plus, there are a lot of like complexes in Midtown that have like medical student specific places like there's U Towers that has like a whole floor I think of med students and like Studio One where I'm at um, there's a lot of med students in that one too so you can find places that have a lot of med students which I think is nice to be around people who are going through the same thing as you are. Oh 
but I also the union is there's the union and that one is furnished too, which is nice. There's another question about resources um, that they offer. Uh, so, uh, so they give you, um, or year two, they give you question banks you can use to, to practice questions. They started using osmosis this year. They gave us that. I don't know, do any of you guys use osmosis? I can't really speak to that, but I don't think. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I use it pretty rarely, but it's nice to have videos for free that the school provides to like kind of help solidify material. And the, you can check anything out from the library for free. I don't really know how that works during COVID, but like in person, you can check anything out. Um, and tutoring, like a lot, um, there's some M2s, SILs. What does SIL stand for? Does anyone know? Supplemental instruction later, I believe. Yeah. So they, they're, <laughs> they're like the tutors for um, M1s who are either having trouble or maybe fail the test or something like that, that they offer, which um, I've heard really good things are very helpful. And, um, yeah, I mean, what like once you're here, they don't want you to fail. That looks bad for them. They they want everyone to do well. So they they uh, they definitely provide a lot a lot of academic support if you need it or if you want it. So they they want you to do well for sure. Yeah, I think if you oh sorry Ariel, um, if you score below a certain um, like number on your exams, they will automatically reach out to you and um, offer you resources and like a tutor. Yeah, like being an M1, I'll just say like the first week or two, I had plenty of resources. Like I was flooded with resources and it almost was kind of overwhelming, but you'll find like what works for you. And also like now that everything is virtual, I know we, we have a lot of um, online like study sessions that they'll host, like Zoom sessions. I don't know if they did that, you know, when before COVID, but it's super helpful. And then the professors are really open to like taking questions and we post our questions to Canvas or if you have any pressing issues, you can email them. So I just really like that open communication. And yeah, like the SILs, like I, I'm personally an SIL, like they do with every unit that you have, like based on the systems, they do review sessions. Like they will be down in the anatomy labs helping out, asking you questions. So that's a big help. And then I know another resource that Pretty much everyone everyone uses this first aid, which is like a a godly book that like tells you everything you need to know for step in the future. So um, let's see. It looks I think we answered Kathy's question about housing and apartments. So Studio One, Midtown, uh, U Towers, and um, if you get accepted in there's a Facebook group that you'll definitely be able to find some um, places and roommates and all that, so. Um, something I learned, so, someone, asked, someone asked, um, was something you learned about Wayne that you didn't know before applying or interviewing? I didn't realize how close we are to like so many hospitals and so many things and how many opportunities there are to actually get involved in your first year, um, which was really cool. Um, and I also didn't realize that we are like one of four or five schools that does a full cadaver dissection. Like a lot of schools do pro sections or they don't do dissections at all or, you know, different things like that. But like we go through the entire body from head to toe and dissect everything. So I think that's that kind of hands-on experience is really cool. And I didn't, had, I had no idea that Wayne was one of the only schools to do that. I'd say something else that I kind of learned being here is not as much as about Wayne State, but more of like Detroit in general was like getting to understand kind of how systematic changes in a city through like housing discrimination and that sort of thing affect the healthcare of a population. And I feel like learning that dynamic here in Detroit, a city that's really been affected by this a lot, will help me in the future as a physician because I've been able to, well, I'll be able to see how it really does affect people. Um, and be able to help people wh wherever I am in the country and have a better understanding of that. So I think being able to know this community is something that's going to be very helpful. I'm seeing a question in the chat about what makes Detroit, um, what makes the medical school experience unique compared to other schools um, because it's in Detroit? I mean, kind of building off what Mark said, like there are these disparities in Detroit because of these systemic issues that we have. But because of that, I think as you, especially we haven't been in our third or fourth rotations, but 
during that time, we were going to encounter like cases that you would not normally encounter in a lot of other med schools that aren't in a city with where these disparities are like commonly found. So I think that's a unique thing where we're, we're going to get a more like wider view of what healthcare is like, because we're going to be encountering so many different types of patients with different um, conditions like that. I think another really cool thing is um, being in Detroit, there's a, a big homeless population and there's like um, volunteer things like street med is one of the um, student orgs where you can volunteer and go around, like use some, some days you just drive around and like ask homeless people if they need anything. And you ask, you try to help them fix any sort of medical problem they might have. And that could be like medications. It could be like they're cold, they need socks. Like, um, I don't know, just really cool thing being in a city where, I mean, like, yeah, like Mark and Brennan were talking about, just the disparities. Okay, I just want to go ahead, uh, thank you guys all for your questions in the chat, and just encourage you that if you do have questions, you're also welcome still to turn on your mic at any point that there's a pause. Um, but other than that, I'm seeing this question in the chat that says, how is the transition between undergrad and medical school? And if you took a gap year in between, how is that transition? So yeah, I didn't personally take a gap year, but um, you know, the transition was definitely rough for the first couple of weeks. It's just, you kind of get just a lot more information that you're used to in undergrad. It's just a lot more. I do think the school does a like orientation week. Well, we had two weeks. I think the M ones had one week this year, but it kind of, it, it's kind of focused on how to study and making your own path to studying, which I think was probably a good way to ease yourself into med school. Um, I, go, go ahead, Ariel. Ariel. I was just going to say for me, like, I graduated in, in 2017, and I worked for two years as, like, a scribe and a medical assistant, and then last year I did Wayne's post-bac program, and that program really just taught me how to study again from being out of school for two years, and just the pace of med school so like my first week it was fast paced but I felt like I had a handle on it because of my post back experience and the pace now is definitely still picking up but I just feel like if you can organize and just keep calm and you know you'll, you'll handle it. Yeah so I did three years um, gap year and I did not do a post back or anything so coming back into it was pretty rough especially because undergrad I was talking to my friends the other day like I I don't think I studied during undergrad unless it was the day before a test. Like I just didn't have to, like there wasn't as much information. Whereas now if you don't study every single day, you're behind. It's kind of just, it's, it's just learning how to study again and in different ways and finding what works for you. But it's, it's definitely doable, but it's, um, it was more than I thought it would be, especially taking three years off. But I, I don't know how Brennan did, did it going straight through. I would, I think like a one year gap year would have been probably, I think ideal, but yeah, everyone's different. I'd say I also took uh, two years. Um, in addition to what all I said, um, the other thing is like not having like weekends off is something that was a transition for me. I was used to, you know, you put in your 40, 45 hours of work and then you're free for the weekend. Um, and so being, having to be able to like budget your time where you can still have your own free time while also still studying. Uh, that's something that is a little bit of a transition. And sometimes I'm like, I'm gonna only study until noon today. Like if it was a Saturday or Sunday, I'm taking the rest of the day off. And I always feel like I'm much more refreshed that next day if I do something like that. So it's something that, you know, you kind of have to be aware of about yourself and work on that. Yeah, I think like what I did, like personally, it's, I've, I've been worse at it this year, to be honest, but taking like a day off a week, it's just like a wonderful idea. Like your brain needs it so badly. Like just to take some time off, do what you enjoy. Because you kind of just have to get used to the fact that you probably aren't going to know everything that you're taught in a unit. You're not going to be able to master it as well as you would like to. So just kind of getting that, getting past that and just with knowing that, taking that time off just you know, wellness and all that, yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and ask um, the next question in the chat. It says, extending off of research, do you know, or are any of you interested in taking 
a year or two off um, of a leave of absence for research fellowships during or after medical school. I mean, I'm not planning on doing that. I think that's a great idea, um, if possible, because it is, personally for me, it is definitely hard to incorporate research during school because, you know, you're generally pretty busy. So like for me, I have to do it early in the morning, which is not really fun. So if it's possible, I think it would be a, a good idea. Yeah, I think like that's an important balance. Um, I lived with an MD PhD last year, which if you guys are not familiar with that, it's they do your first two years of getting your MD and then they get a PhD between their end of their academic and before their clinical stuff. So that's like three to four years and then they go back. And I'm sure it's gonna help them with a ton of residency, but I can't imagine doing that personally. Um, but I think it is a balance. You know, you can get some research experience. It's hard to like get published while you're in school or it's harder to get published while you're in school, particularly if you're doing a longer study where you're having to recruit people over, you know, the span of a year. By the time you get the study started, recruit people and then get the data analysis and publication and stuff. That That's pretty much four years, three to four years right there. So that can be a challenge. But also I know some residency directors, even the more competitive residencies, they actually kind of prefer not to see people take that year off. Um, I was talking to uh, my mentor at Wayne was like a dermatology um, residency program person. And he talked about how he didn't like seeing people do that because he felt like that kind of gave like an unfair advantage to people. So it's a balance. Like some people really like it. That helps you get into some residencies and some residencies don't like it. So. And um, I think it's also easier to get um, research experience like while you're in medical school because I think people take you more seriously. Like I, um, like I did research for three years before I came here. So I had like a resume already, but like I do research in a lab right now. And um, in the lab, the fellow I work with was like, oh, you're a medical student? Like, do you wanna help me on this paper? Like they'll, they'll, they'll definitely like, they, they know what it's like to be a medical student. They know that you wanna get papers published and things like that. So I think they, they take you a little more seriously. So maybe you don't take the time off. Um, that's my experience anyway. I think that they, they, they wanna help you <laughs> while you're still in school. And then I just wanted to add, like I sat in a QA and a last week with, um, an admissions director for like neurosurgery at Henry Ford and she was just stressing how like of course research is important but just for example for neurosurgery you don't have to do the four years of neurosurgery research and then apply and think oh I don't have this specific type of surgery she said I just want to see commitment in your genuine interest in whatever research that you're doing you can apply to whatever specialty you're interested in and kind of even going off that, I'd like to be an advocate for the non-researchers. Um, even an undergraduate, I'd avoided uh, research like it was the bane of my existence. Um, and even in medical school, it's not something that really drew me. Um, and you know, maybe at some point I'll, I'll try to do something and even more clinical research is what interests me more. So I think there's more of an opportunity for that in the next uh, couple of years. But anyway, I just wanted to say that if you're not um, super research focused, the good thing about Wayne is that there are opportunities, but it's not forced on you either. So I think that's a good aspect of the school. Also one other thing about getting published, um, my current clinic person, a doctor, I don't know what to call him, uh, he went to Wayne State and he was actually showing me some of his like clinic write up or papers that he's written on like complex cases that he dealt with as a medical student here at Wayne. And so that's another way that you can get published is if you have a very unique case, you can kind of write that up as some sort of public on a publication. And because of the pathology in Detroit, where you do have a lot of unique patients that you might not see elsewhere in the country or less of around the country, you have more opportunities to, you know, oh, you can be like, this is a really interesting case talk to the attending there and try to write that up as a paper. So that's kind of a good, easy way to get a publication too. Yeah, plus there's an entire elective built in that you can sign up for for your first two years at Wayne to like set up a mentor and that'll like it is an easy way to get research as well. And I personally found like before the elective that I signed up for, I just emailed one of the professors that I liked and was like, can I do research with you? And they were like, yeah, sure. So I think a lot of the faculty is very open to most medical students helping them out. Awesome, thank you guys so much for answering that question. I saw this question come up in the chat and I think it's a really great one for us to talk about um, that really gets to the point of today's chat. And that's, the question is, could you please mention some of your favorite non-academic activities in and around Detroit, such as favorite hikes, study spots, and then how is, how is life in Detroit in general?
So, I mean, I, I really enjoy living in Detroit. Uh, it's obviously a bit different with COVID. There's less stuff to do, but um, I've been here for like, it's been two years now, yeah. Uh, I just went on the De Quinter Cut for the first time, which is like a really nice trail, not even trail, but like paved path to bike or walk or run down. Super nice. There's there's like an outdoor bar like halfway through at some point that you can hang out hang out at too. And there are a few other like outdoor bar areas to hang out with during these COVID times. So it's a lot of fun too. Yeah, I was just gonna say like Detroit just has so much to offer. We have like campus marshes in the winter where you can go ice skating and stuff like that. And like Brennan said, it's a bunch of bars everywhere. It's tons of study spots. Um, I'm from Detroit, but I currently live in Southfield. So like I, I find like Southfield is like super boring compared to Detroit. I always come to the city to hang out and I just love it. And it's just a lot of cool outdoorsy spots. And uh, it's a place called Punch Bowl Social downtown. They have like an alley with a whole bunch of cool bars. So it's always something to do. Yeah, um, some other things like this was pre-COVID, but uh, everyone always asks about the gym whenever we give tours. So I should just get that out there. Um, there's a big undergrad rec, rec center um, that we have access to that has like it's four floors. It's got like a track upstairs, three basketball courts, weight room, lots of cardio, so, that, so anything that you really would want for gym wise is there. And I had a group of, I was with a group of first years last year when I was a first year that on Fridays we'd get together and we'd play basketball. We'd play like pickup and like have like 10, 15 of us get together and play at the gym. And that was always really nice because you'd get to meet people in your class or interact with people in your class outside of like an academic setting. So it's a little more casual. Um, and that was always just a great way to kind of blow off steam from the week. So I, we can't do that now because of COVID, but I, I missed that. Uh, and then there's also a gym in the med campus in the basement, which is really nice um, because a lot of med schools don't have that. And even though it's kind of small, I've, I've never had an issue finding equipment there. Um, so that's two nice things in terms of that. And then in terms of activities, um, I'll let Catherine talk a little bit more about this. But uh, Catherine and I, we started a little group called the Detroit Striders. This is since COVID and we try to find other fun things to do. Where us and a couple of med students kind of go on these long, you know, five to 10 mile walks around Detroit, kind of experiencing different stuff there. So I'll let her do more. Yeah, we, uh... Mark said, we just, we, we see like a lot of parts of Detroit. Yeah, I think you wouldn't normally see if, if you were just like driving through. Um, really cool parts. Um, and DeQuinter Cut, like Brendan was talking about, super cool. Love DeQuinter Cut. Also fun to bike on that. You can bike to Belle Isle. You can walk to Belle Isle if you want. Um, um, a, lot of, a lot of things to do outside. Detroit's really fun in the, in the summertime, definitely. And the cool thing, um, too is people who aren't from Michigan or even if you are from Michigan maybe um, it would give you an opportunity to explore other parts of the state too there's all kinds of places up the east coast is just a quick drive on Lake Huron or you can cut across the state and go to Lake Michigan um, so throughout all the seasons there's something to do in all parts of the state so it's a good opportunity to explore yeah a lot of places to camp that's great restaurants too downtown um, I highly recommend to Koi in Corktown. Get there at some point, it's so good. All right, guys, I'm seeing another question in the chat as we're talking about this, and I think it fits really well. What are your favorite restaurants and coffee shops in the area? I know Brennan kind of answered that, but I think like we really need to talk about food in Detroit because it's one of the better parts. Yeah, I, um, my, my go-to recommendation for people, it's also in the Corktown area, is uh, something called Green Dot Stables. It's got like 15 different like types of sliders and stuff. And so like, no matter who you go with, someone's gonna find something that they like. And it's kind of a fun place. It's like an old like horse stable that they turned into like a restaurant and bar. So that place is really fun. Um, but in general, like I really like going to Mexican town. Uh, Detroit's a very multicultural city. So you have Mexican town, Dearborn and Hamtramck where Dearborn and Hamtramck are more like Middle Eastern food and then Mexican town obviously is Mexican food. And so it's really good to like be able to kind of immerse into those other cultures and have those sort of things. So I don't necessarily have a favorite anywhere, but. but. 
and I'm like super big. I love brunch. So like it's a lot of different great brunch spots. Like I love Bobcat Bonnie's down in like mid Cork Town, I believe. And then it's a place called Central Kitchen. It's like right across from Campus Marshes. So yeah, it's a lot of great options. Yeah, there's Slow's Barbecue too in Cork Town. Just, you know, great places in Cork Town, I guess, so. I also will just chime in on the food and say there's really good options that are really close to the school as well. So people who are from Michigan, we have a Hopcat that's two blocks from the school, which is a great place to go hang out with uh, friends, classmates, whatever, um, after a long day or something like that. Um, and then we also have a restaurant, like we have ramen places close by, taco places close by and stuff like that. All right, I guess we'll move on to the next question um, that I'm seeing in the chat now then. And this question is how frequent are exams usually? And are they divided up by subject? Could someone speak about exams in general? So if somebody wants to touch on curriculum really fast. So um, yeah, it's like the first two years it's system space. So it's by each like system. So it'll be like musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, pulmonary, GI, renal. So I'd say it, on average, it's like about an exam a month. Um, first year, you have a couple extra exams during like your exam week period, but exams are generally, you'll have an, ex an NBME exam. So that's like a multiple choice exam with like retired step one questions. And then first year, you'll, you tend to have a histology exam. So that's looking at like microscopic slides on a computer and like identifying certain things that are tagged. And then you'll also have a anatomy practical. So you'll be down in the anatomy lab doing um, 100 questions of identifying tag structures on the cadavers. And then second year, it's just one exam, a unit, um, the multiple choice and BME questions about the system that you're on. Okay, that was pretty extensive um, review of our curriculum. Um, I hope that was able to answer the question. If not, um, feel free to speak up or go ahead and post something more in the, in the chat if you have um, something more you'd like answered about that. So another question I'm seeing um, in the chat is about um, step one being turned to pass fail and what are some other things then aside from step one that might um, help to strengthen your applications? So um, this doesn't really apply to us second years, but uh, just looking at it kind of as a, evaluating what it is, um, I think Wayne State does set you up pretty well for that because as you heard, like everyone's pretty active and can be as active as you want. And with that, you're able to boost your uh, application with all that sort of stuff. Um, because Wayne State has so many hospitals affiliated with it and so close, um, you can get shadowing opportunities and really work with certain positions if you really find a position that you like, even starting your first and second year. And that can help you, you know, get a great rec letter from them. Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can kind of build your application, kind of show that holistic thing, which is really what, I mean, that's what med schools want, that's what residencies want. And relying too much on the numbers doesn't really get you anywhere. And I think that's why they moved it away from pass fail. And so being able to take advantage of all those opportunities at Wayne will help i think it'll help our first years a lot when they're applying against a bunch of other people where this step one score doesn't really matter so much I think, uh, go ahead. okay um i think leadership is a big thing that we um allow oh here's my cat um <laughs> that wayne allows you to do um being even starting your first year, like in the, in the first couple months of your first year, you can start to get leadership opportunities and continue those uh, as long as you wish throughout school. So that, I think that'll be a strong point on all of our applications. Yeah, I was just gonna add that like leadership and just being an overall well-rounded applicant, um, you know, testing well in your first two academic years and then also doing really well in the clinics and stepping out and going that extra mile. Okay, thank you guys for answering that question. Um, I'm kind of combining a couple of questions that I'm seeing coming up in the chat now. 
And that is um, about the learning communities and how can you make the large class size at Wayne State feel small? Um, and what are some things that the school is doing to help you connect with other students? So I can speak first. Um, I would just like to say about, well, you get an anatomy group. So I started off by getting really close to my anatomy group and like my network of connections has just expanded from there. And then um, I love the learning communities. We do like meetings once a month and I, I'm able to talk to people. And just a lot of our sessions are very interactive. So you're gonna meet people along the way anyway. Yeah, I mean, with anatomy groups, like you're down in the anatomy lab a decent amount with five other people. I think that month it's split already, but, you know, cutting into a cadaver for four hours, you get pretty close to those people. So that's like a great way. And then the learning communities themselves are the way to just make it a lot smaller compared to that. And then I see the question, like, do you get to know everyone in the class? I personally feel like I don't know everyone in the class. Like, I feel like I've, I'm still many people, but I think that's that's kind of cool still. I like that, the fact that there's still people I'm, I'm gonna meet and maybe be making new friends still. And I'd say another big one is uh, clubs, of course, because then you meet people who have the same interests as you. Um, and that's another way to divide up the big class and get to know people. And I think one of the really big um, benefits of having such a big class is for like networking later on in life. Right, so like since we, we are the, the biggest single campus medical center, right, in, um, in the country. So like we, we have, I mean, all my, like we have 300 people a year graduating basically. So that's 300 people going across the country. And that's the odds of you meeting another Wayne doctor are higher than any other doctor. So I think that that, um, that really helps in the future to have a school this, this big. Thank you guys so much. I love those answers to that. And it's so true. Wayne State really does implement a lot of things to try to make this large class feel smaller and to make you feel supported and to make you feel like you know people. Um, one other question, I haven't seen it in the chat, but it's something that we've gotten asked a lot in the past. And I thought today would be a good point, um, a good time to touch on this. Where do you guys go grocery shopping? I know a lot of people know that like Detroit is a food desert. It's hard to get food. You got to go out of town. You have to have a car. Um, so you guys, can you, can you just talk about grocery shopping and some options you use to get groceries to your place? So yeah, I mean, there's Whole Foods in Midtown. Uh, I don't go there, it's too expensive. Which I wish there was another grocery store that I could afford down here. But first year I didn't have a car. So what I did is I would tend to like do like grocery delivery and you do it through like Kroger. It was like 10 bucks for a delivery and I would try to like get a, a month's worth of, worth of food and then do like once a month do groceries that way. And then this year I, I have a car, so it's, it's a lot nicer. So I go to, I drive out to Royal Oak and get, go to Trader Joe's there. But there are, there are alternatives to getting groceries besides going to Whole Foods downtown if you live down this way. Oh, I pretty much same thing as Brennan. I like, I didn't have a car last year, um, but I, one of my lab mates from Anatomy Lab would drive me to Trader Joe's once every other week and we go together. So um, yeah, I'm sure you, like, even if you don't have a car, you'll probably know someone who does. And, and they're usually more than willing to help out. And yeah, having a car now, I drive to Trader Joe's by myself in Royal Oak. It's like a 20 minute drive from where I live. It's not terrible. Definitely better than Whole Foods, in my opinion. And like, it's not like you can't get anything in Midtown. Um, definitely, I like, if I'm going to go shopping, I'm gonna go either Trader Joe's, Kroger, Meyer, and all of those are within like 15 minutes of here. Um, having a car is helpful or knowing someone with a car, as Catherine said. Um, but also, like, there's this place called Marcus Market that, like, it's a little m place. It's got everything that you would need. It's just marked up um, right in Midtown, right by the med school and all the apartments and stuff. And I feel like every time I go there, I run into a med student. So, like, you can get stuff and have really good tacos that it's $1.50 on Tuesdays and Thursdays. But uh, it's it's definitely, like, you can get stuff around if you need to grab something. And then, yeah, you, you have to make a little trip to go to the grocery store. But I feel like in most places, you aren't going to be living right next to a Myers or Kroger. So it's not a huge difference. It's also a place called like Easter Market. It's kind of downtown, but they have like really good produce and meat and everything like that. And Easter Market's definitely like bikeable, walkable. Super cool too. And uh, the produce is pretty cheap for the amount you get. It's nice. 
Well, thank you guys so much for sharing about that. I really like that Mark uh, mentioned Marcus Market. I also love Marcus Market. And just for reference, um, I ran out of vegetables the other day and I went and I bought like some vegetables and stuff to make salads. And I can make salads for the whole week for like eight bucks. So if you're in a pinch, it's really great. There are um, little stores here and there, but then for your big runs, you could do every like two to four weeks, depending on the schedule. Good question. Um, this is yeah, for, sure. for my panelists too, because I remember hearing about this, like an orientation. Doesn't Wayne have a, like their own kind of market where they sell produce to students in the beginning of the year, I thought? I don't know. It's like the outdoor market or something. Yeah, so it's like, for the people that know Detroit, to answer your question, I guess, uh, it's off on the corner of like Woodward and Warren, which are like two pretty main roads. They have like a farmer's market. I think it's like every Tuesday or something, but it's not happening because of COVID. But what I'm really annoyed by is I didn't learn until like when COVID started that you could get like through Wayne, you could get like a free like $10 credit to go shop there every week or every month or something. So I could have gotten free food, didn't even know about it. So that bums me out. But after COVID, I'll probably use that. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Um, I just know that that's a question that so many students have coming to Detroit. And I think that um, just hearing from you all um, and what you guys do to get food, I think it's just comforting and gives people a really good, great idea of what life's going to look like. Um, along those lines, um, a little bit more of what life looks like. Somebody asked, um, how is commuting in Detroit? Do you mostly drive? And then um, a question about rent. Is the rent expensive? Um, really just kind of how did you decide where to live? Um, so commuting, you really, I don't think I know anyone who's taken the bus. Have you guys? Um, I, there's a queue line that's running when COVID's not happening. It goes just from midtown to downtown, which is convenient if you're going to like a game or something. But to get around, you pretty much need to drive if you want to leave the city. Um, biking, super bikeable, very bikeable city, um, very walkable. You can walk anywhere from midtown, downtown, super easy. Um, and rent wise, I definitely live, I think one of the cheaper places that I know I pay 700 bucks a month for a studio. I know that a lot of people who live in like the big complexes pay like a thousand or more. Um, it's just, I mean, depends on what you want. I, I wanted to live alone and I didn't really care about living in a big complex. So I think I, I, th I think 700 is, I pay less than anyone I think I know. So that's probably the, the bottom bar. <laughs> you will pay more uh, to live in like midtown downtown area and rent uh, than you would if you were outside in the suburbs but then you would have to have a car or a way of transporting so it, we all kind of feel like it balances out one way or the other um, so it really just depends on on what you want to do um, my rent for midtown brennan and i are actually roommates um, and we pay uh, eight 1800 total for the apartment two bedroom two bathroom so it's um it's fine you know I feel like it's kind of what you would pay in any kind of city so um it's it's one of the options and then your other one is living in the suburbs for a little cheaper right I mean it's very nice to have be, have like a five ten minute walk to the library or like the medical campus it's very nice yeah, I commute to and from Southfield and I like had no problem. I know our MSK unit when I was in the anatomy lab a lot, I was driving a lot the last month. And um, I would say like, I filled my tank up on Sunday and it lasts me all week. And the only thing that was kind of annoying was parking sometimes because I just did not want to buy the past because I'm like, we're only really on campus so much this semester because of COVID. So, but I've been able to find parking, street parking, it's not expensive at all. So. Yeah, and just to kind of add to that, um, I was actually able to beat Catherine and my rent was $600 last year, no big deal. But you do have to live with, I lived with three other med students uh, last year and we had a house and that's a, that's the way to do it cheaper. Um, it is kind of hard because you only go in with, so you would have to go in with a bunch of people that you didn't know and hope that it worked out. But yeah, there's some like houses I lived within walking distance. This is a neighborhood called Woodbridge. It's um, yeah, it was actually a five bedroom, like made a spare bedroom. Um, and that was not too bad. So if you're really worried about the cost, I'm sure there's other people that are worried about costs and you can kind of find people to kind of get with. But yeah, if you're gonna live with alone, or live alone or in one of the big apartment complexes, you're gonna be spending at least eight hundred dollars, probably close to nine hundred, a thousand a month. 
Thank you guys so much for answering that question too and for being candid about the choices that you made. Um, I will say just in general, speaking with other students who go to medical schools in other cities, um, and of course our cost of attendance is adjusted based on what the cost of living in the city is, but rent in um, Detroit, at least from my experience, is less than rent in Ann Arbor, is less than rent in Chicago, is less than rent in New York, um, is less than rent in California. So, I mean, it's really, is about the city that we're in and then also just um, knowing that once you're here, the financial aid, if you, if you need it, it's there for you and it's gonna support you um, to be able to live comfortably in the city. So we're gonna move on um, now to another question. One that I thought was a really excellent question. Um, the question is, what challenges are you facing as medical students and are there any changes you'd like to see at Wayne State? Um, I think one thing that they've gotten a lot of feedback on and I can't tell if they're doing better or not because of COVID, but like we got a lot of emails um, and like that was, it doesn't seem like it's annoying, but like when you wake up each morning and you wake up to like a bunch of emails, well, I guess if you sleep in, um, that's something that like I would lose a couple of emails or miss something that I needed to know. Um, and so the, the school did get feedback about that and they did work on changing that. Um, I still feel like because of COVID, like there's so many things that they have to, you know, update you on and that sort of thing. And like all these organizations are constantly like doing these virtual things. So we do get a ton of emails still, but that was, that was a big annoyance that I think across the board, a lot of medical students had that they worked on fixing. For me, uh, being an M1, I'm still just getting used to the sheer volume of information on top of all the other activities they that's required of us to participate in because i, I kind of came in thinking like i knew i was going to have other stuff to do but i was like okay most of my time is just studying but no you're going to have other things that you're assigned to do so just balancing your time well and like i know for me personally i kind of for some reason feel obligated to be involved with like extracurriculars like these organizations and stuff but then i have some friends or classmates who are like you know i just want to focus on studying and that's okay do it that do what you have to do to, you know, adjust to med school. Don't force yourself into something. Don't stretch yourself so thin where you kind of stress yourself out just coming in the door. You have to get acclimated to it. Yeah, and I don't know about my other classmates, but personally, when COVID hit and school started back up again, my wellness personally took a decent dive. I, I was extremely anxious. I just uh, stressed out in general. So I think that's like a challenge for a lot of med students is like, balancing that like oh you're a medical student you have a lot to do like you have this class every day work to do all the time and learning how to take that but also prioritize your mental health and make sure that you are not burning out prioritizing um things you like to do so that you can actually like succeed these four difficult years of your life yes it's okay to take a break like I know a lot of people ask, how much do you study? How many hours per day? And it's like never going to be consistent for me personally. Like, I'm not going to say I'm going to study six hours every day, Monday through Friday. Some days I'm like, okay, I just need a nap and I'm okay with taking a nap and getting back up and getting to work. And it's just about having that balance, like Brennan said, and making sure your mental health is clear pretty much. Well, thank you guys for taking a minute to talk about that. I think, um, I would go ahead and bring up just one more challenge that I think a lot of people, um, it's kind of a, some sort of stigma about Wayne State that the communication is bad. And so I just want to say that that, that is being addressed on every level in the university. Um, we have a new dean who's coming in who's really passionate about making the communication better. We have a couple of people who are um, hired in administration in some way that are working on communication. And so I know getting waned is a thing that people talk about. Um, and it has a negative connotation, but I just want um, everybody to know who's interested in Wayne State that that is something that the school is not blind to. They're working very hard to correct that. Um, so I just wanted to encourage you guys that that is some, like Wayne State, they see their problems and they really are trying very hard to fix them. And there's a very um, much open door policy at the school when you see something that you don't think um, is functioning well, there are many avenues in which to go ahead and um, let administration know about that and, and act change at the school. Um, I can give one example for us when we applied when you got accepted there was no phone call or anything that or like any like information packet about 
Um, congratulations, welcome to Wayne. Here's a lot of this stuff about us. Here's a call to congratulate you. We're really excited to have you. Um, it was just an email. And so we brought that up. And that's something they're actively working on changing right now. Um, and hopefully you guys will see um, a positive outcome from that. So just know that this is a school where your opinions um, are valued and will be heard. So um, there is another question that I'd like to jump to next. And that is, um, could you guys just talk about mentorship um, and how you guys found mentors or maybe how mentors have um, been a part of your life at Wayne State? Yeah, so I mean, I personally have a research mentor from someone that in one of the classes that I watched, I really liked just he made these terrible jokes and but I liked how he taught. So I was like, oh, I want to work with this guy. So I emailed him, we met and decided like, oh, I'll do, he'll let me do research. So like how, how it works with him, I, we meet once a week over Zoom. We talk about um, the research we're doing. We talk about how school is going, just how life is going in general. And then like he's just been very helpful in getting me published. Like he's helped, he put me on a paper that, you know, I didn't have a lot to do with, but he still, he still like made sure I got published on it. We're working on a second paper already to get published on. Um, he works really well to prioritize like projects that I can do, like quick projects to get good publications with. Um, but yeah, he's just been very good. Like a lot of mentors at Wayne, I think really prioritize, like they just know that as med students, they want to get as much it's kind of sad, but like resume builder filler kind of stuff. So they do want to help you get that while also giving you like the good research opportunity that you're looking for. And then other stuff. Um, I don't know if the M1s are doing this this year or not to the COVID, but you know, amongst our like small groups, learning communities and stuff, we each would like meet maybe like once a month with like, there's like 10 students with like a, a mentor that was a physician that went away and that was in the community. And it was very informal, like it'd just be in the evening, they'd have like pizza or subs or something and we just kind of eat. And they kind of just talk about, you know, any problems that we're having or like talk a little bit about like what they look for when they're looking at med students, that sort of thing. So it's a really good way to kind of informally learn from people and like you could bridge that into more if you wanted to. Um, additionally, like for research, and this has kind of been touched on, but um, like you're free labor and like you're already vetted and qualified. And so a lot of people do want to do research with you or will let you do research with them uh, because they get someone to do some project or some stuff that like maybe they couldn't get done with their time or their budget, but having a very qualified, dedicated person to do that, uh, that's something that they want to work with. So that's pretty easy to get mentors in that way like I had to send an email to the guy that I was interested in and he responded in a couple of days and got me on a project um, for me I am still currently looking for a mentor but I do find like these interest groups are essential because for example I told you I'm a part of a neurosurgery interest group uh, they recently sent out um, something where we could do research with a physician at DMC and I sent her my information and I was approved. So if it weren't for that interest group, I probably wouldn't have seen that opportunity. So it's definitely important to just like look around uh, what your interests are and kind of network like that because I was very appreciative of that. Something else is your second year, you're in a clinic, like a primary care or family medicine clinic, uh, and you go every two weeks and you uh, just kind of help the physician. It depends on the clinic on what you get to do, but uh, you're under the supervision of a physician there and you kind of get to practice your clinical skills and uh, decision making and everything that you've learned your first two years and I think that's been at least for me a good opportunity because you really get to know somebody that way they get to know you for months and they get to see you grow and they teach you things um, so I can definitely see that as a mentorship opportunity as well that's uh, definitely longitudinal Thanks, Claire, for bringing up clinics. Um, one of the last questions that was in the chat that I wanted you guys to touch on, um, maybe Claire, if you wanted to just add anything really quick, was about um, how often and early do students work with patients um, and are students able to choose at all um, the hospital that they become associated with? Yeah, so for patient interaction, your first year, um, hopefully, I think our current M1s are not able to volunteer in person at clinics. Hopefully, they'll figure things out as COVID goes along. But 
theoretically, your first year, um, you can volunteer at like student run clinics, which is a great opportunity to interact with patients. Um, and even on virtual, you can uh, interview them and get to know them and practice your skills. So you can take histories and practice your vital signs a lot of times. And there's a lot of opportunity to get involved your first year that way. And then your second year, you are assigned to a clinic site. Like I said, you go every two weeks um, for about four hours and get to work with your physician there. Uh, for that one, you had some opportunity to um, select where you wanted to be and what kind of, maybe if you wanted pediatrics or not. Um, I wanted to go in the VA. I'm actually in the Navy on a scholarship. So I wanted to work uh, with the VA and they placed me there, which has been great. And then for your um, third year rotations, you do get to rank the hospitals that you'd like to be at. And you know they say they take that into consideration. And of course, everybody can't be placed in their first choice, but there is opportunity to rank where you wanna be. Thank you, Claire. That was an awesome description of what clinics are like here. And I just want to get to one last question um, before we finish up here. I maybe just one or two of you guys could quick talk about it. Somebody was asking about, um, is it feasible to go home on a weekend if you have a four hour drive to home? And maybe just talk a little bit about um, the time you take off on weekends and what kind of time you have for travel. Yeah, I, I think Claire can definitely talk on this, but I, um, I think it's, trying to fit that like take a day off on the weekend is makes it very possible to drive somewhere else too because then you have the entire day off to drive and then you can still study the next day at wherever you're visiting so I think it's completely doable I'd say like the weekend before an exam I probably wouldn't personally but that's a personal preference kind of thing yeah for the four hours um since I had lived in Cincinnati for a while before I came here like that's where a lot of like my friends were and so during my first year like I would drive four hours on maybe like a Friday where I'd get all my work done that I wanted to do for that day, drive Friday night down, um, hang out in Cincinnati, maybe get some studying done on Saturday or Sunday and then drive back on Sunday. And as long as like you're kind of have what you need to have done before that weekend, um, that was always something that I could do. And obviously visiting friends is a little less focused than visiting like family. So certainly visiting family, like you could go home and study a little bit if you needed to. So that's definitely a very feasible thing to do. Also, it's also okay if you don't have everything done. Like you'll, you'll catch up, it's okay. Like fall behind a bit to have a nice weekend without medical stuff in your head. Because most of our exams are like at the end of the month, generally, at least for this year, here it is. I, I made it a ritual, like after every exam that weekend, I go somewhere on a road trip. So it's definitely possible. Yeah, and I'd say definitely during, um, COVID has actually made it easier because you have less in-person required events. So um, my mom lives in Charlevoix, so I've gotten to visit her a lot. That's a four hour drive. So I've taken like a week up here in the middle of a unit and you just kind of make it work and um, you take time for your studying, but you also take some time to do some fun things too. So it's definitely doable. Thank you guys so much for um, all of your, you know, answers and for being candid today with students and for answering their questions. I hope um, everybody that came today that you guys were able to get something out of this. I put um, in the chat the MD admissions email. If you have any further questions, please feel free to email them. I also put my personal email and the other uh, panelists are welcome to do that as well. Um, if there's something that um, I said or one of the panelists said that you're really interested in, um, you can email them at admissions um, or email email us if people are okay with that. And then I'm also going to post right now um, a website where you can see all of our other events that we're having in, in the future, webinars like this, or also coffee chats. Um, but we are really happy to share with you guys today. Thank you so much for being here, and thank you again to the panelists for answering the questions.